it was time for us to consider the realm of the atom, where relativistic events are more usual than on the roads of Texas. Of course, for, for real motorcycles, the velocities are much too low for the effects of relativity to be noticeable. It's even uh, for the spacecraft circling the Earth every 90 minutes, the uh, speeds are too low. They, they move, in fact, about 140,000th the speed of light, and uh, their increase in mass due to motion is less than one part in a thousand million. Hmm. Astronomers looking at distant stars and distant objects are seeing systems moving with a substantial fraction of the velocity of light. And when we enter the atomic realm, we uh, enter into an uh, area where the relativistic effects are very noticeable. Even on your television screen, the electrons that paint the television screen are moving with uh, perhaps 20 to 30 percent of the velocity of light, and uh, thereby their mass is increased to the order of a percent or so. Out at uh, Stanford at the Linear Accelerator Center, we produce the highest energy electrons in the world. They uh, come so close to the speed of light that their mass is increased by a factor of 40,000 compared to what they started with. As a result of this very high velocity and high energy that they acquire, their clocks are slowed down. And they don't realize that they have moved the full two mile of our accelerator. In fact, from the electron's point of view, their clocks are moving so slowly, they think they have gone only two and a half feet by the time they come to the end of the accelerator. At the end of the accelerator, we also have a storage ring, so-called spear ring, where we smash the particles into one another. We create new matter. And in this way, we can very accurately measure the conversion of energy of motion into matter and into mass, and in this way, confirm with great accuracy the Einstein equation, E equal mc squared. What an equation that is. It looks so innocent. E, energy, m, mass, and c, not the speed of light, but the square of the speed of light, an enormous number. So the little mass is worth a lot of energy. It's hard to appreciate what an enormous leap of intuition and imagination it took to come to this simple formula. Einstein had been thinking from the age of 16 to 26 consistently about the nature of light and electromagnetic radiation. And almost as a byproduct of his, of his uh, thinking on this subject, he came to the following conclusion that if you look at light, say, from the sun, and if you were moving towards the sun, as we've already discussed, the light would become bluer. Now, the blue light has more energy than the white light we normally see, and therefore, he reasoned, there must be more energy apparently coming from the sun. But if that energy is not drawn from any change in the motion of the sun, it must mean that that energy is coming from the mass itself. And so he concluded that the mass of the sun itself is converted directly into energy. He then made the enormous leap to, to generalize this result to all forms of energy. In the 19th century, there had been energy of motion, and energy of light, energy of heat, but not interconvertible. And so he came to the startling conclusion that all mass and all energy are in fact equivalent. We are led to the more general conclusion that the mass of an object is a measure of its energy content. It is not impossible that with materials whose energy content is variable to a high degree, for example, with radium salt, the theory may be successfully put to the test. What Einstein is noting here is that the energy release in nuclear reactions is so great that there is actually a measurable change in the mass that can be uh, detected and this formula can be verified. The uh, nuclear burning together with the Einstein relation E equal mc squared solved a long-standing riddle, namely how is it that the stars, the sun, can burn for billions of years without running out of uh, material? 
this equation, E equal mc squared and the efficiency of nuclear burning, were tested quantitatively in 1932 by Cockcroft and Walton with their accelerator, who verified it for the first time. But it was a long time before any practical use was made of it. Einstein was hounded out of Germany. He came to Princeton, where I had the pleasure of seeing him after his arrival. But it was five years from that till that fateful day when I went down to the pier in New York, and the ship came in with Niels Bohr and the word of the discovery of the fission of uranium. January 16, 1939. And not long after that, Einstein wrote that fateful letter to Roosevelt with all its consequences. Hmm. Extremely powerful bombs of a new type may thus be constructed. I understand that Germany has actually stopped the sale of uranium from the Czechoslovakian mines. And it was hardly 200 miles from here across the desert that that first dramatic explosion took place that brought us into the true atomic era. Einstein, who set it all in train, was appalled by the nuclear arms race. It's ironic that this humble, gentle man who had been an avowed pacifist should now be etched in the history of mankind as the father of nuclear weapons. He believed, as do many today, including many scientists who are familiar with the devastating effects of these weapons, that survival in the world with nuclear weapons is one of the great challenges of our generation. It was, I believe, his last official act to endorse a manifesto in 1955 with uh, Bertrand Russell, which I believe you have here. Yes. We appeal to you as human beings, to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. I think in talking about Einstein's great achievement, we should really stress the fact that it lies at the basis of all life. The nuclear weapons are only a small byproduct of uh, human folly. Even when I strike this match, a minute amount of the mass is converted into energy. If I took all the mass in this match and converted it into free energy, there's enough energy here to lift the entire mountain on which we're sitting now about 10 feet off the ground. This energy plays a role in the hum of a violin, in the growing plants here, and in fact in the expansion of the universe. <laughs>